Simple always over complex, even when training is fairly complex. If simple works, one of the things I said on the podcast, I mean, it really matters. People will ask the question, like, why wouldn't you just go to com- something complicated? Wrong question. The right question is, if simple works, why would you do something more complicated? You're listening to Barbell Logic, brought to you by Barbell Logic Online Coaching, where each week we take a systematic walk through strength training and the refining power of voluntary hardship. Welcome back to Barbell Logic. This is your producer, Trent, and you're hearing my voice because we're going to do something a little bit different for the next few weeks. We are going to revisit the minimum effective dose programming concept, which we first hashed out on episode number 53. So that was over 200 episodes ago. Wow. And over two years ago. So minimum effective dose programming is simply the idea that instead of jumping from one template to another to evolve our programming and continue progressing, that we instead look at the reasons why we're not progressing anymore and try to figure out the the simplest, smallest move we can make with programming to get things moving again. And what you end up having in practice is instead of these hard switches from one template to the next template to the next template where there might be multiple variables changing, we instead end up with this nice, smooth progression changing one variable at a time so that you end up evolving into new templates, if you will, instead of making hard switches. And really, you could think of this type of programming as having no template at all. There is no template. There's simply getting to the bottom of why you're not progressing anymore in a given lift and figuring out a simple, rational way to fix that problem. And that's important because we want to think for ourselves. We don't just want to copy what others have done. Even if we can learn a lot from the coaches and lifters that have come before us, ideally we'd like to have a deeper understanding of why things work so that when we have our own unique problems, we can come up with unique solutions to them. So this concept of minimum effective dose as applied to strength training has become something of a signature for Barbell Logic, and we've hashed through this idea over many, many episodes. You can go back and listen to episode number 53 to hear the the basis of it, and you can listen to just about any of the programming episodes we've done since then to see how that concept gets applied over many different training problems and through many different phases of advancement for a lifter all the way from the novice to the very advanced lifter. So with that said, despite all of these programming episodes that we've done, one of the most common questions we get at Barbell Logic is, hey, I just finished novice linear progression. What do I do now? Where do I go from here? And we realize that it's pretty tough if you're not a coach and you don't really program for people regularly, it can be tough to understand what exactly is going on and how to think about your strength training when you don't have a coach to guide you through it. And so what we're going to do over the next few weeks is we're going to listen in on a masterclass of minimum effective dose programming that Matt delivered to some of the Barbell Logic staff coaches back in the fall of 2019. So this masterclass was several weeks long. It's comprised of eight lectures, and we're going to listen to a condensed version of these eight lectures to hear kind of a soup to nuts approach to the MED or minimum effective dose model for programming. And hopefully after these few weeks, you'll have a solid idea of what to do with programming because you've built it from the ground up and you understand why we recommend the things we do. So since Matt originally delivered this as a lecture to other Barbell Logic staff coaches, what you'll be hearing is a recording of that lecture but I have edited it down for clarity and just to keep things moving and to remove some of the communication back and forth between Matt and the other lecture participants. From time to time, you'll hear my voice jumping in to guide you through where we are exactly in the talk to explain any visual references that Matt uses, which we will also post in the show notes if you want to see those there, and when necessary to repeat any questions that the seminar participants asked of Matt. All right, so without further ado, Let's listen to part one of the MED Masterclass. Hope you enjoy it. 
How's everybody doing? Good? Yeah? Yeah, doing good. Thanks. You guys ready to roll? All right. So I'll do a little bit of an intro here, and that way SP will sign on for over the next few minutes. Um, we won't get into the meat of this stuff. So again, this is recording. It'll be there for you guys can to reference. Nobody gets a grade on this, by the way. This is not what this is for. The idea is to just get a really good handle on the theory behind programming, how we program. And so uh, for me, it's important as well because it helps me distill the things that we've talked about, the things that we're doing at Barbell Logic, the stuff that Scott and I have talked about on the podcast. And that has, that has really helped form over the past three years or so some of these, some of these mostly minor changes about programming. But um, one of the things that we noticed, and a lot of you guys have probably heard this on the podcast, is that really everybody, including us for a long time, you would just do a program. And when the program stopped working, you're like, okay, it's time to go to the next program. And so often people would start with just novice linear progression. And I'll kind of back up and walk through why here in a minute. But and when LP stopped working, you would move on to the next program, whether that was that was usually like Texas method or heavy light medium or, or something like that. And then when that stopped working, you would move to the next thing, whatever that was. And Scott Hambrick was really the one that started to, to flesh out this idea on the podcast to say, hey, like that's not actually what we're doing on a day-to-day basis. He's like, I've, I've watched what you're doing in your programming. I'm watching what I'm doing in my programming with my clients. And we don't move them from one program to the next we're making the smallest change we possibly can. And there's more of a transition process so that there isn't ever really a primary template that the client is using. It instead just goes from one thing to the next step of changes, which could be one variable. It could be two variables. It's really more than two variables that change to another. And then when that stops working, we change another variable or another. We make the smallest change we possibly can. And we do that as long as we can. And the reason we do that is because as we train clients, for us, very different than your your standard sort of personal trainer or even a personal trainer is probably focused on strength training in your sort of globo or box gym, is that our goal is to keep our people forever, like long term, I mean, for multiple years. And if that's the case, then we want to be able to have quantifiable evidence that what we're doing works. And so it really is just taking the simplicity of the basic scientific method and applying it to programming. So let's start at the very beginning because it's a very good place to start and talk about why we start with novice LP. There are three basic criteria that we use for getting stronger, um, with, especially with concern to exercise selection. So if you think about somebody, probably not you guys on this call, but somebody like your mom or your coworker or a family member or whatever, they walk into a gym for the first time ever, and there are literally an infinite number of exercises that they could possibly do, right? There's, there's all the hammer strength machines and the Cybex machines, and there's the free weights, and there's, there's hundreds often of pieces of cardio equipment. And like, where do you start? You know, I mean... And not only that, there are multiple ways to do many of those exercises, right? So certainly, you take something like a squat. I mean, there are, there are scores of way to do it, ways to do a squat. So what we identified years ago, really probably more than a decade ago now, in the starting strength community is that we choose exercises with the three basic criteria of we pick exercises that use the most muscle mass, we do ones, we pick exercises that use the most weight and we perform those exercises over the greatest effective range of motion. That's, that's the idea. And when we do those things, we come up with the, the four primary strength exercises. Those are the inarguable ones, right? We know we're all going to squat, we're going to deadlift, and we're going to overhead press or press, and we're going to bench press. That's it. And anything else is sort of icing on the cake. And certainly you can include things like a power clean or a power snatch or things like that are perfectly fine as well. Um, You know, there are other exercises that you can still use those three criteria and you can identify that these exercises are better than other exercises like chins 
are probably better than a hammer strength ISO row or barbell rows. So those three criteria work really, really well for exercise selection. And one of the things that I want to do in this class is identify some of those major pieces that we can use as sort of overarching themes or philosophies that we use for programming so that you understand, okay, well, what's the next step we're going to take? That makes sense? We then take that, those three criteria and we apply them to those main lifts. So we can say, okay, we've got this giant number of lifts and we can pare it all down. And we know if we use these three criteria of like the most muscle mass, most weight, greatest effective range of motion, then the squat is probably the king of all of the exercises. So we covered the three criteria in more detail in episode number 244. That's part two of the Getting Started series called How to Get Strong, where Matt and Scott walk through how exactly the three criteria lead us to select the squat, bench, press, and deadlift as the main list that we should do. Now, how do we perform the squat specifically in a way that still fulfills those three criteria the best way, the best, the best way possible. And so that's how we start to identify things like, this is why we do a low bar squat. This is how we use more muscle mass in the squat. This is why we like a low bar squat over a high bar squat or over a front squat or over whatever. And so we end up with these, really these four basic exercises that nobody really argues about. So then the question is, if you take those four exercises, and we start doing novice linear progression. So we're basically just going to add weight to the bar every single time. Now, here's the question. Why do we do that instead of something else? Like, why do we not go three sets of five to three sets of six to three sets of seven, whatever? Why is weight the thing we add? So one listener suggested that just adding reps takes you from five to six to seven to eight and so on. It takes you from a rep range that emphasizes strength gains to a rep range that we more commonly associate with hypertrophy or muscle growth and endurance or conditioning. What's the goal in the beginning? What's the primary goal? Get stronger. And strength is force production, right? That's the thing. So the best piece of quantifiable evidence that we have that force production went up is that the weight on the bar went up. This is why any basic linear progression program is perfect for a beginner because every time they go in the weight room, they're going to add weight to the bar. And if you can add weight to the bar every single time you go to the weight room, why would you do anything else if the goal is to get stronger? So like, I know most of you that are on this call, there's a bunch of people that are on this call who are not novice trainees or a bunch of you who are late intermediate and even advanced trainees. Can you imagine what it would be like as an advanced trainee to be able to go into the gym and add weight to the bar every single session? If I could go in the, in the gym and add weight to the bar every single session, that's, I would still, I would do that forever if I could. Because the primary goal is to get stronger and, and strength is force production. And the more weight that's on the bar, the more force I have to produce to move the bar. That's the idea. And so in the beginning, we get a really clean look in the novice linear progression of the actual stress recovery adaptation cycle, that SRA cycle, which says that the workout or the stressor is going to create a stress. It's going gonna, it's gonna to drop our performance. We're going to then recover from that stress and super compensate, right? You guys have seen that before. Okay, so this is your basic stress recovery adaptation cycle. The idea is you come in on Monday, you train, the stress drops your performance. You increase then as you recover and adapt and you go beyond what was initially the baseline and you create a new baseline. And then on Wednesday, you train again. Boom, drops the uh, performance, right? Because you can't, you can't squat the same thing you did on Wednesday 12 hours later. It's going to take a little bit of time. And then you're going to recover. And you're going to move beyond what baseline was on Wednesday. Now here I am on Friday. And the nice thing about a linear progression type program where the only variable that's being changed is intensity, 
is that it gives us the cleanest view of the stress recovery adaptation cycle, right? That stress recovery adaptation cycle was really originally talked about, at least in the literature, I'm sure other people talked about it beforehand, by Hans Selye, uh, or Selye, in 1936. He called it the general adaptation syndrome. And, and he said, this is, this is what happens. Like if your body is exposed to a stress it hasn't been exposed to before, it's either going to kill you, and squats probably won't, or you're going to recover from it, and you're actually going to get better. You're going to adapt. That's the idea. And for the novice linear progression, that's exactly what happens here. So the entire stress recovery adaptation cycle is essentially 48 hours for the novice. It's basically what it is, right? It's, 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 two, it's 48 to 72 hours, two to three days. And you actually completely stress the body, completely recover, adapt. You're not the same person on Wednesday that you were on Monday. And then you do the same thing on Wednesday and you recover and you adapt and you're not the same person on Friday that you are on Wednesday. And by the way, that's why the first eight weeks of a basic linear progression program is so fun because every day that you go in the gym, you're setting these big PRs because you're not the same person that you were. But then here's the question is like, what happens when this stops working? We know this can't work forever or we would all end up squatting 900 pounds for three sets of five. We come back two days later and squat 905 for three sets of five. Like we know we can't do that. And so at some point it changes. And I don't think that this model is wrong. I just think it's generally incomplete. And so the other model that really builds off of this model is what's called the fitness fatigue model. And that looks like this. So again, check the show notes and you'll see graphs for both the super compensation cycle and the fitness fatigue model. So that fitness fatigue model says that performance here, the blue line, is the sum of or the cumulative effect of the stressor and the stressor if it's specific to the adaptation we want. So if we're doing strength training and the goal is to get stronger. And there is both an increase in fitness, or you could even say an increase in strength, an increase in the ability to be strong. But the, the net negative effect on performance is the fatigue of that workout, right? So as you go in, especially your eight weeks in, 10 weeks in, 12 weeks in, in a novice linear progression, the amount of fatigue like this, when you go in on that first day, like Monday or Wednesday or Friday, or especially in weeks two and three, how much fatigue is actually present? in the workout, like my argument would be, it would be re it's a really low swing here. Like the net negative effect of fatigue in weeks two and three are low, but the fitness is still very high. So the net on performance is significantly above this baseline. But as you move further and further down the road, you get, if you know, you get to the point where you're, you know, I don't, I don't know, you're a, you're a normal guy that's under 35 and you're squatting, now you're squatting 285 for three sets of five on Monday. Well, 285 for three sets of five causes an enormous amount of fatigue. But we also know it, there's a net positive effect of this. And that net positive effect lasts longer than the net negative effect. So in the initial day or two of that LP, the net negative effect says, well, man, there's still a lot of fatigue present. And so performance is still below baseline, but at some point I'm going to recover day two and day three performance goes above and then it's time to train again. And you'll repeat the cycle over and over again. And I believe that this is a more complete view of the SRA than the basic SRA, because I don't think that this occurs outside of the first eight weeks or so in novice linear progression. Because what's going on is there is still clearly after the first, it might be the first four weeks, it might be the first 11 or 12 weeks, but somewhere in that ballpark, there's still fatigue present. There's still a negative effect on performance present by the time it's time to train again. Does that make sense? So let me stop there for a second, take a quick pause. I want to make sure that you guys understand the general concept difference of. SRA versus fitness fatigue. And I also want to be clear about this. There are going to be times where I'm not saying stress recovery adaptation is not right. I'm not saying it's wrong. 
I'm saying it's generally incomplete. You know that any of you who have trained, probably just about everybody on this call has trained before, you train when fatigued. Four weeks in on novice linear progression, you're not training when fatigued. You train, you recover within the next two days, you eat your protein, you sleep, get your groceries in, you train again. You're not fatigued from the workout 48 hours ago or 72 hours ago. But you get to a point six, eight, 10, 12 weeks in, well, that's not the case anymore. And for the rest of your life, that's not the case. The only time you're going to train when you're not under fatigue after that novice linear progression, if you did it right, is the morning of a powerlifting meet. When all the fatigue has dissipated and you've, you've completely peaked. Okay, so I'm going to stop for a second. Questions there. One question. Are we getting away from the term supercompensation now? Supercompensation is a word that I think showed up in the 70s, which is just an idea that says, hey, your body, it, it, the, better, the better word is adaptation. The semantics probably don't matter as much. The problem with the word supercompensation is that it's, it can't be quantifiable. Yeah, so the problem with supercompensation is, here, here's the question. If you squat three sets of five at 315 on Monday and your body supercompensates, air quotes, how much can you squat on Wednesday? Can you squat 320? Yeah, probably. Can you squat 317 and a half? Okay, probably. Can you squat 330? Maybe. We, we actually don't know. And so the idea is not that your body supercompensates. It's that it's that 315 for three sets of five, the first time you do it, your body is not adapted to that. It disrupts homeostasis and causes fatigue. It causes like all of these things to occur in your body, both like physiologically, hormonally, all these things are happening on a musculoskeletal level the first time you've ever done something. And then your body starts to adapt to that so that it can better handle that next time. But you're not going to feed it that next time. You're going to feed it a little bit more next time. You're going to go up based on what we do, probably five pounds. You're going to go to 320. So that's, that's why super compensation, it's really a play on semantics more so than just saying it's wrong. It's just that how much you quote unquote super compensate is, is, is fuzzy. We don't know. So another question was, fatigue is pretty obvious. We all kind of understand what that is. But what does fitness mean exactly? So I I actually don't like the word fitness. So, and Scott thinks it's fine. There's nothing wrong with it. Just think about this. The word fitness, you could replace it with many other things. The word fitness is the net positive effect of the stressor. What's the positive, not the net, what's what's the positive that comes out of the stress and the fatigue is the negative and the net effect is the performance, the cumulative effect, the sum of those things. So we're constantly playing a balance game. Once we get into this outside of novice linear progression, where everything is a very clean stress recovery adaptation cycle, we start playing this, this game of trying to manage both the positive effects of training and the negative effects of training. If the positive effects of training are not enough, then the adaptation will not occur because there's no adaptation to happen. If the negative effects are too much, like if you, if you train too hard, too long, you continue to build up fatigue, you get to the point where that negative effect is so much greater than the positive effect and performance will never rise above baseline. Now, again, it's very hard to actually identify exactly what those things are. We know that it's, you're constantly playing a balance. And by the way, you're not constantly playing a balance just in the training world or the weight on the bar or the volume or the sets and the reps or the frequency or any of those things as we talk about variables here in a minute. You're also trying to balance those things with life, which is one of the hardest things that we have to do as a coach. It's one of the most important reasons that we have a personal relationship with our, with our clients. It's why I, it's why I very much believe that basic template-based programming doesn't work. Because if, if I hand one of you a template-based program, I don't know that 
you're about to go through a two week period at work where you have to work 80 hours a week. I don't know that you're about to go through a fight with your spouse. I don't know that, you know, like whatever those things are, I don't know that you're about to get, like you're about to get the flu. You're going to get sick. You're, you know, your dad's going to get ill and you're going to have to drive across the country and like training is going to be tough. And you're going to be sitting in a car for 12 straight hours. Like all those things are important. And so those things must be taken into consideration. So there are certainly stressors that will have some positive effect on training and some negative effect on training. A squat, if done correctly, will have both. But a fight with your wife will only have a negative effect on training. It will have no positive effect on training whatsoever. So there are, we have to, we have to, that's why that communication has to be open and important between the two, between coach and client. Makes sense. So in the comments here, Scott made a good point that fitness, we have to be careful about how we use the term fitness and how we think about the definition of that term. In the fitness fatigue model, fitness doesn't just mean like the general connotation of fitness, like a tennis player is fit just like a cyclist is fit, just like a American football player is fit. The word fitness is actually much more specific in the context of this model. Fitness means fitness for purpose, fitness for the adaptation that you've identified to develop. So in our case, we're trying to develop strength. So fitness is adaptation to the task of force production and nothing else. It doesn't mean fitness for other tasks in life. It doesn't mean any of the other fit general physical skills. It means fitness for force production, which is our definition of strength. So when we talk about increasing fitness or fitness moving above the baseline as a result of training, then we mean very specifically force production or strength. Yeah, so the thing to understand about the fitness fatigue model is that it wasn't written specifically for strength training. It was written for just any... It, it was specifically focused on, on physical training, but that fitness fatigue thing, thing could work just as well for endurance running. Or if, you, if you do an endurance run, there is, a, there is an effect that occurs that is both positive and negative, and there will be a net performance decrease or increase or decrease first and then increase later. Like if you go out and run, if you're not used to running and you're trying to get ready for a half marathon and you run five miles, you probably can't run five miles the next day. But at some point, the fatigue from that running five miles will dissipate and the adaptation to running five miles will still be there. And then you can go back next time and run five and a half miles or whatever, right? And we're going to try to hone in on the strength side because that's what we do for everybody first. So let's, let's actually stop there. And I know you know this, so we'll, I'll keep it really quick. Why do we do strength? You guys all know this answer. Like, why is that the thing that we hone in on here, even for people who want to get better at running marathons? Because it makes everything else better. And it's, and it's a one-way street, not a two-way street. None of the other things work, right? Certainly, after the first couple weeks, none of the other things work. So you could theoretically take somebody who's never squatted before. You could have them ride on their bike for two weeks. And their squat would theoretically go up. It probably would go up for two weeks. And then it wouldn't, right? We know that if you take someone, especially a middle-aged person, older person, and you work with them squatting, they squat. At first, they, they really struggle to squat full range of motion. And then they eventually get to the point where they can squat full range of motion. We know that their mobility gets better. Their range of motion gets better when they squat while they get stronger. But we also know that if you took the same person and they didn't squat, and they just went to yoga class, their mobility would probably get better, some, maybe. But we definitely know their strength doesn't get better going to yoga class. Right? And that's not shitting on yoga. It's just that that's just, that's what's so good about strength. Strength is the most general of adaptive responses. That's why when we focus on those things like voluntary hardship, we sort of try to, try to focus on strength because strength is the most general thing that you can do for all demographics that requires some voluntary hardship. Most people, like we're not required to involuntarily try to be strong anymore. These are things we all have to choose to do. And whether that's, that's, a, that's a world-class athlete or whether that's 83-year-old Sybil, everybody chooses to be strong. That, that takes some voluntary hardship on their part. And, and that makes all the other things better. 
Okay, so let's go to the big picture about minimum effective dose stuff first. Let me set this up a little bit. So as I mentioned before, so, so Scott and I talked about this a lot on the podcast and a lot of what has come out of this is from our discussions on the podcast as we really looked at what we were doing at in the online coaching business as well as what all our other coaches were doing with online coaching and, and in person as well. What we saw was that when you started to plateau in programming, it made sense based on the, the very simplistic notions of the scientific method that we would make the smallest change possible. If you could make a single variable change, we're going to make a single variable change. Sometimes that requires a two variable, two variable change because things like intensity and volume are often have an inverse relationship. As one goes up, the other one has to come down often after LP. So in LP, if you think about it, volume stays exactly the same, right? It's three sets of five for most of the lifts. Frequency stays exactly the same. The only thing that changes is intensity going up. And that's good because the goal is force production and strength. That's what we want. Then it stops working, it slows down. What do you do? Well, rather than taking the person and saying, well, hey, let's reset two times, back off 15%, run up again, don't change anything. And then when you plateau again, just move to the Texas method. None of us were actually doing that in the online coaching business. We were all actually just making small individual changes that gave us good data. Now, if you think about the fitness fatigue model, where we're trying to balance the relationship between increasing stress, which has to increase over time. We know stress must increase over time in programming. It has to. While not driving somebody into the ground and creating that fatigue dip that's too much that they can't overcome, where do you start? What's the first thing you do? One of the overarching themes of what we do is that we always want to choose simple over complex. Always. Because if simple works, why would you be more complicated? It doesn't make any sense to me. So what I want to do is I want to keep things as simple as possible because my goal is to keep the person as long as possible. And I want to have quantifiable evidence that what the changes changes that I made worked. If I make a complicated change, and what I mean by complicated is I change more than two variables. If I change three or four or five or six variables and completely change the program, whether it worked or whether it didn't, I don't have good data. I don't know what worked. I don't know what didn't. To me, that'd be one of the most frustrating things ever. If I if I completely changed somebody's program and they got way stronger and I was like, I don't know what the thing was that made them stronger because I changed too many variables. You would never do this in, in, in the lab and any science class in, in a 101 college class in a chemistry 101, biology 101, like you would never do that. You change the least number of variables. We have a control. We're going to change a variable. We're going to see how it works. We're going to get our feedback. And then we're going to adjust. That's how this thing works, right? I've got this hypothesis. I'm going to test it. I'm going to work it into a theory. I'm going to retest the thing, see if it works. Well, how do you do that if you change four, five, six variables all at once? Now, I'm not talking about milking LP on a half pound. I'm not throwing quarter pound plates on each side of the... I've, ne I've never done that. I've never used the quarters in my whole life. I've never put quarters on for 83-year-old ladies. I've never done that, right? Some micro plates, sure, yeah, I'll use one, 1. 1.25. Sometimes I'll use 0.5s and jump a pound. But like, I'm not, I'm not going to milk LP for the last, like, four weeks that I can. And over four weeks, the weight goes up every single session, and they, and they increase a total of eight pounds. I'm not interested in that. I'm talking about LP stalling and moving to a four-day split or a DUP-type program RPE based, multiple exercises, even if it worked, what worked? And if it didn't, what didn't? 
And so to us, a, a, an overarching theme of this class is going to be, we always want to make the simplest change possible that gets us the greatest return on investment. So Daniel, you were saying like, if complicated works better, yes, let's do it. But even if it worked better, I don't know if you could hone in on why. Yeah, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pose a question and then we're going to take like a three minute break. So here are some overarching themes that we want to stick with. You guys can write this down if you want to. Some of these are, are, these are definitely very important. We always want to choose simple over complicated. That doesn't mean there is a time, isn't a time, where programming won't be somewhat complicated. It will. Like you get to the point where some of your clients will become advanced enough, will become national level athletes. The programming will have to be complicated, but don't get there early, right? I remember telling the story about when we interviewed um, Jillian Muncie Ward. I coached her for maybe four years and she set the all time world record at the 148s. And she did basic block training. As a matter of fact, I really honed my knowledge of block training at the time with her. Now, block training is far more complicated than novice linear progression. There's way more training that's more complicated than that. And we, that was where she needed to be. And, if she, and she ran through it a couple of times. And after that, she would have had to have gone to DUP, but then she decided to be a IFBB pro bodybuilder. So she did that instead. <laughs> so, so the programming changed, right? So that's number one. Simple is always better than complicated. Always. We want to make the simplest change possible. That doesn't mean single variable every time. I want to be clear. Minimum effective dose for maximum return on investment. Sometimes that minimum effective dose is going to be a couple variables. Sometimes it might even be three, although rarely, but it could be, right? I just want to make the smallest change I can because it gives me the best data. Two, we're always going to go from basic to individual. We start with basic. So, so the first one is simple is better than or simple is greater than complicated. Number two is that we're going to start basic and then I would put arrow instead of greater than. It's going to go from basic to individual. That means everybody does the same thing at first. It doesn't matter if the goal is to be a competitive powerlifter, a competitive bodybuilder, a crossfitter, an 83-year-old lady who's just trying to get healthy. Everybody does LP. That's what everybody does. Some, some tight variation on. And then as time goes on, based on their demographic, based on their goals, based on like those sort of things, the training will change from more basic to, to specifically individualized. And then very similar to that, I would call this 2A and 2B rather than 2 and 3, would be it would move from general to specific. And that's where everyone's going to train for general strength first until you're generally strong. And then we'll start to hone in on the specificity. We know from the said principle, that the adaptation that we expose our body to is specific. So why you, that's why Scott can't get in a fight with Charity on Tuesday night and the stress isn't enough fighting with Charity to drive up a squat PR the next day, right? He might be better at fighting with Charity on Wednesday, but he ain't going to be fight better at squatting, right? It's specific. And in the beginning, the goal is force production. So the specificity is going to be really important as we get to variables. This is why we lean so heavy on increasing intensity. Intensity, how heavy? If the general goal for everybody is to get strong, and strong is force production, which means strong and force production means how heavy, then how heavy is the most important thing we do. Even at a trade-off, to reduce volume or reduce frequency if necessary to keep driving the bar weight up for as long as we can. I'll get there here in a minute. And by the way, you can disagree with this part. It's okay. Like, I don't want this to be a class where you guys feel like you can't disagree with me. I'm not guaranteeing that I'm right. But if the general goal for everybody is to get strong in the beginning, then getting strong, in the, that's the point. And like, at some point, we're going to have to bring in some of those other variables, right? So simple is better than complicated. Everybody's going to go from basic to individualized. The person who's going to train to be a, even the person who's going to train to do strength lifting versus the person that's going to train to do power lifting is going to be a little bit different the more advanced they get, right? There's going to be a, a heavier emphasis on the press or the bench press 
based on the competitive sport that they've chosen to do, right? Charity is, is primarily a strength lifting athlete. She's, got, she's one of the best pressers in the country. She's going to focus on press and her bench press is going to be used to drive up the press. Whereas my, my lifters that are primarily power lifters is the other way around. They're going to primarily bench press. The bench press weight on the bar is the most important thing. And the press is used as a supplemental movement, basically to drive up the bench press. And then general to specific, which is now I'm training for specific goals. And those goals might not always be strength. For some of those people, it might be, hey, I want to be a really good soldier. I want to have really good conditioning. I want to do excellent at mud runs. I want to have a better blood lipid profile. Like all of those things might change the way you program on a general to specific sort of method. Okay, uh, let's take a four minute break. I'm going to pee really fast, get a water, and we'll meet back here in like four minutes. We'll talk a little bit more. All right, let's talk about uh, let's right. talk about variables. So, when it comes time to make those minimum effective dose changes for maximum return on investment, I would argue that there are only four variables that can really be manipulated. There, the, you could always come up with a fifth or a sixth that are clearly uber minor comparatively. But what are those four variables that can be manipulated to increase or decrease stress? Intensity, which <laughs> just means how heavy. That's all it means. Doesn't mean how intense. Doesn't mean how hard did it feel. None of that stuff, right? Volume, which I define as what? Sets and reps, right? But really, it's how much. So if you think about it, and I'm, if I were explaining this to your mom, then you could say intensity is how heavy. Volume is how much. Frequency is how often. And then the fourth is the exercise selection, right? One question here. Doesn't frequency just equal more volume? It could be, right? So I make that argument, I think, in the article some. I think that in general, frequency is often a function of volume, but it isn't always a function of volume, right? So certainly you could do six sets of five on Monday, or you could do three sets of five on Monday and Wednesday and have the exact same volume, but higher frequency. So it does, it's not, doesn't always work out that way, but most of the time, frequency is a way to drive up volume. Not always, but most of the time, right? So yes, good question. Um, so those are, those are the four primary variables that can be driven. Now there's some other stuff too. We can, we can do rest periods or like another way to think about rest periods is density or the amount of work you can do in a specific amount of time, things like that. Um, that's just not that important for us right now as long as we're, especially if we're talking about in the beginning of moving out of novice linear progression where the primary goal is strength so for rest periods we talk about this that we're going to make sure we rest enough um, enough time to complete our reps there are certainly times I've, I've trained a handful of you on this call where i actually set your rest periods as you become more advanced i'm like hey you're going to do six sets of three every 90 seconds you're going to do a set and i do that i'll utilize that sometimes but that's not in the that's way 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 down the line right and it's and it's also a very minor thing so primarily we're not talking about rest periods and we're not talking about amount of work that you can get done in a specific time period the primary four things you can change are intensity volume frequency and exercise selection and and in the med article i talk about intensity and volume being the two primary ones and frequency and exercise selections being secondary but i think i would actually lean towards intensity is is 1A, and everything else is way below that. Why? Because intensity is the goal. Here's what we know. We know that intensity increases have a direct effect on strength increase. It is force production. It is the goal. Is it possible to increase volume and not get stronger? Yes. Yes. All the time. German volume training, 10 sets of 10. We know that doesn't work very well for strength. We know squats sets of 20 doesn't work very well for strength. 
we know that what bodybuilders do doesn't necessarily work well for strength and they're still increasing mus muscle cross-sectional size with their hypertrophy right both the contractile tissue and the and the storage piece the sarcoplasm it doesn't always lead to strain now it often does a big jacked muscular guy is going to be stronger than a skinny 145 pound guy right same thing with frequency does frequency always equate to strength gains look at crossfit people who are really into crossfit they train every single day often twice a day and they're not very strong but that's not the primary goal for them so if the primary goal is strength intensity is the thing that we are going to drive up forever as the primary variable that's going to be titrated up if i could titrate intensity up for the rest of my life i would it's just at some point i can't and i have to get stress from other places but as long as i can get the stress i need from intensity i'm going to get the stress i need from intensity and i know it's okay we'll be cool and politically correct here we know that there's lots of arguments about this on the internet with people it's fine it's just that some people think that volume will actually drive up force production better than intensity will. And it's just wrong because it's not the same thing. And the interesting thing is, is that that same group wouldn't tell you to train seven days a week, twice a day, 14 times a week, 11 times a week. And that that would make you get stronger. Like nobody would argue that super high frequency is the thing that makes you get stronger. I think that very few people would argue that exercise selection is the primary thing that makes you get stronger. If you really want to get stronger at the squat, you should do tempo pin squats. Nope. You should do squats. Are there, is there a place for tempo pin squats? Yes. Why do we do squats to get better at squats? Let's go back to our our basic priorities. Simple versus complex, simple over complex. I'm trying to get squats better. Right. How about basic? How about the three basic criteria? Most muscle mass, most weight, greatest effective range of motion. Which one can I lift more weight on? A normal low bar squat or a tempo squat? A normal low bar squat. So that's what I do. It doesn't mean there's not a place for those other things. There are, and there will be down the road. But in the beginning, we're talking about right now, again, my brain only works this way. We're going to do this class in a very systematic, logical progression. So I want you to think about if it were you or some of your clients who were coming to the end of LP, what are the changes you're going to make? And this is the main question I want to pose to you. What are the changes you're going to make to keep making the bar weight go up? Because isn't that the point? And let me stop. Is there any reason that that's not the point at the end of LP? So Jason Ball had a question here. What about if the athlete wants to peak. So we know we can get more weight on the bar if we lower volume at the end of LP and essentially bring the volume down so far that they're just going to peak and be ready to hit a one rep max or three rep max, but then would require a deload period in order to get back to their previous three by five working weights. So like certainly there are some people towards the end of LP We're going to try to peak them and let them hit like new one rep maxes, new PRs, maybe a three rep max, things like that. That's a peak. And actually, I'll I'll come back to that here in a second. But when we do that, after they've peaked and hit new one rep maxes or three rep maxes or whatever you decide is like the primary thing they're trying to hit, then is there a time to back off the intensity and to drive up another variable? Well, sure. Right? How many of you have competed before? How many of you have done a strength lifting meet or a powerlifting meet? What do you feel like four days after the powerlifting meet or strength lifting meet? Yeah, the answer was beat up. Yeah, you can't come back four days after a powerlifting meet and go up, right? Like it's just not possible, right? So yeah, there are certainly times when intensity will not be the primary goal for short periods of time. But in general, while we're trying to get people strong, intensity is the goal. And even when 
your post meet or post peak, the ultimate goal is always an increase intensity as long as strength is the primary goal. Now, there may come a day where strength is not the primary goal. That's okay. There's, not, there's actually nothing wrong with that once the person has a good general base of strength. And this is why we're going to use for your, what I'm going to have you guys do is pick two very specific demographics, like an actual person. You're going you're gonna to come up with a fictional person and you're going to show me what the end of their LP looks like, what the first minimum effective dose change you would make as their LP starts to die, what would you make for them? So like maybe you pick a, a, a 21-year-old guy who weighs 210 and maybe you pick a 60-year-old lady you know, who's got osteoporosis or whatever. Um, it doesn't matter to me. I'm going to let you guys pick that stuff and I'll actually type this stuff up so you guys have a specific... And then I'm going to say like what... What are the changes you're going to make, right? But remember that the goal for us primarily is increased force production. So it's increased strength and intensity is that thing. Now, let me come back to, to that because this is important. People will argue that a max heavy top set of one, three, five reps is a performance and not a stressor that will disrupt homeostasis and cause an adaptation. You guys, have you heard that argued? Like, well, if you work up and you just hit a new PR for a one to five rep max, that is not an overload event that will disrupt homeostasis that you'll get better at. What is your experience, both personally and professionally as coaches? So several people here chimed in that that they feel pretty dang fatigued after performing a 1RM, 3RM, 5RM. And I'll chime in with my own personal experience. Absolutely. There is a period in intermediate training where a heavy, heavy, heavy 5RM, 3RM, whatever, is very fatiguing. And you might be surprised how long that single set can drive strength adaptations. But like anything else, it doesn't last forever, but it can work for a good long time. Yeah, one of the first things I'll do with my, I, I coach a lot of the starting strength coaches who have come out of doing this sort of like medium volume stuff, like kind of three sets of five world. And one of the first things I do is I just push real heavy for a while. And I'll, I'll even drop the volume, three sets of three. It's like I'm training Andrew, Andrew Jackson. And um, I think when there are, well, let me back up for a second. What's the primary metric we use to make sure that we're making progress and what we're trying to do? PRs. PR. It's all about the PR. Not just the one rep max PR. Any PR. Three rep max, five rep max, three sets of five PR, four sets of four PR, five sets of three PR. Hamburg and I joked about this on the podcast not like at some point, right? The the over 40 PR, the under 40 years of old years old PR, the five hole belt notch PR, the six hole, the seven hole, you know, gaining weight, losing weight, PRs on squats with knee sleeves, without knee sleeves, lever belt, three inch belt. Like, I don't care. Like that used to drive me nuts. But like, if you can compare apples to apples and did better this time than you did last time, you have quantifiable evidence that you got better. And by the way, the PR, in my opinion, is the only quantifiable metric that is truly quantifiable and measures if our strength increased. That's it. There are other quantifiable pieces of evidence, like did tonnage go up? Okay, that's something, right? But like everybody could do 10 sets of 10, and that's a whole bunch of tonnage. I mean, like a tremendous amount of tonnage, and he didn't get stronger. The PR is what matters. That's the driving effect. And I'm going to throw my first, like, monkey wrench in the spokes of the bicycle here. I think that the idea that a novice makes progress every 48 to 72 hours and then an intermediate makes progress every week, an advanced lifter makes progress every month-ish or more is probably the best thing that anybody had ever come up with at the time 
but I think it's incomplete because you can take a person like Charity. I keep using Charity because she's here and I've coached her before and I, I watch her training very close. Charity is hitting PRs on a nearly daily basis right now as a hyper advanced athlete. So is Charity a novice? And when I say PRs, I don't mean she's hitting one rep maxes every single workout. I mean, one workout, she hits a three sets of five PR. And then the next week, maybe she hits a three sets of three PR or four sets of three or five sets of three or a five singles across PR or one rep max, like whatever. Is it? So I don't like the term progress to identify whether you're a novice, intermediate, or advanced. Again, I don't think it's wrong. Just like I don't think SRA is wrong. I think it's a little bit incomplete. I think that you have to begin to define the macro cycle. What's the big cycle time length for a novice, for a true novice? How long is the cycle? 48 hours, maybe 72. That's the whole cycle. The whole stress recovery adaptation thing occurs. That's why it's so clean and pretty and beautiful and works. But after that, what is it? Well, it probably goes, it could theoretically go to four days or five days. Probably for easy math, it's probably going to go to a week, but not necessarily. And then it's probably going to go to two weeks. And that doesn't mean they hit PRs every two weeks. I've got uh, like Harry Fafudis I've been, I've been working with. He's an advanced, I guess he's going to do the coaches meet at the coaches conference here in a couple of weeks. He's going to squat like probably 570 and he's going to deadlift 605. Is any huge PRs? That guy hits a PR every single workout. But he, had, he, hits, he hits a four set of four PR and he hits a four sets of three PR. And I'm not talking about because it it's the first time he's ever done it. I mean, he's done it several, many times with us. And every time he does it, it's more. And so can you say, well, Harry, because you hit a four by four PR on Tuesday. And last week you hit four by four at 10 pounds less. You're not actually making progress or it's a one week progress. or you're just an intermediate. Like, no. Harry's macro cycle is 11 weeks long right now. He's on 11 and we, it's 11. So it's kind of a weird number because we set it up specifically for this meet. So that macro cycle length sets, whether you are a novice, intermediate or advanced. If you can repeat the whole cycle three times a week, you're a novice. If it takes a week at a time or two weeks at a time to repeat the cycle, you're an intermediate ish. And then as it gets longer, you become more advanced, right? Like somebody has to define it. So there's nothing wrong with that. But using the word progress, I don't think is a right is the right word because for me, the goal is to get my clients PRs as often as possible. If it's there for the taking, we take it. Now I want to be clear. I mean, if it's there for the taking as a coach who's programming them, you take it. I also have my clients who are constantly trying to take bigger PRs or PRs that I, that I didn't program for them and they take it early. Have you guys ever done that? So you're like, okay, I'm scheduled for, let's not even say it's a one rep max. I'm scheduled for a three set of five, three sets of five PR, a five pound PR. That feels really good today. I'm going to go ahead and take a 20 pound PR and you do, and you get it. What happens two days later, three days later, you get crushed. Because you didn't manage your stress well. Because while the PR was there, the amount of fatigue that giant PR took, it killed you. Scott was talking about this on the podcast the other day. He hit big PRs like on the press. It wrecked him for like four weeks. He couldn't recover. Right? So that's, those are the things we're trying to manage. We, we manage the variables of intensity, volume, frequency, and exercise selection. In programming, the goal is to be able to continue to make progress for as long as possible. Because at some point, your client, or if you're programming for yourself, will throw, like life will throw you the curveball. You'll get sick. You'll move across the country. You're, you know, your kids will get sick. You'll go on vacation, you're whatever. Like the thing happens, right? Or you just have like a crazy work week and you work 100 hours. And you only get to train like once that week. And then you're all beat up. You didn't eat well. Like these things happen all the time. And so as long as my clients are healthy, 
it doesn't matter whether they're novices or advanced lifters. I am trying to hit some level of PR nearly every session and certainly every week. So here, Hambrick made the point that one way to look at the PR and the way that Matt's describing is it's a proxy for stress going up over time. In other words, if you're hitting PRs consistently, then you know that the stress has gone up. And we know that stress has to go up over time in order to continue to drive adaptation. And the fatigue isn't overwhelming to the point that they can't make the progress, right? So the stress went up, but also they were able to handle it. If the stress went up and they couldn't, you go back to the journal adaptation syndrome, which says like, well, the stress might be so high that it drives you into overreaching and eventually overtraining. That's the point. Okay, let's stop there. This has all been theoretical tonight, I promise. We're going to get real practical the rest of this class, but I wanted to make sure you guys had an overview of the, of the theories. So, simple is better than complex. Everyone will move from basic to individual and general to specific over time. But in the beginning, everything starts basic and general and simple. And it's always going to stay as simple as possible. And as you approach the end of every program, but for this class, we'll start with LP. You're going to make changes, the least number of changes possible to continue progress on linear progression. And I would argue, and if you want to argue against it, it's okay, let's talk. But the goal is still to make the bar weight go up even at the end of LP. And there's some of this in practical programming. You get into it, and Andy talks about this a little bit, where like, isn't the end goal, even if you have to move to like a Wednesday light day or something like that, ultimately the goal is to be able to keep making the bar weight go up on Monday and Friday, if that's what the Wednesday light day is there for. The goal is to make the bar weight keep going up until the person is generally strong. And then for most of your clients, you'll find that they just want to keep getting stronger. That becomes, that's the primary goal for most of our clients. Some of your clients will want to be really, really healthy or start doing mud runs or do other things. And that's perfectly okay. There's nothing wrong with that at all. We're not dream crushers. We don't make fun of them if they want to go run a half marathon. Like if that's the thing they want to do, we actually want to do that. So another question here is, Matt, can you clearly define the end of LP? Does it just mean that the weight's not going up on the bar every session? Great question. I don't know. <laughs> right? There, there's, that's the point, right? The, trans, the point is, is if we go from novice linear progression as written, three days a week, let's say, let's just use the squat, three sets of five. Monday, we do three sets of five. We go up five pounds on Wednesday. We go up five pounds on Friday. We go up five pounds on Monday. At the point that I can't do that anymore, am I at the end of LP? I don't know. No, except here's what, here's what I'm at. I'm at the point where I have to make my first minimum effective dose change. So the question is, what's the first minimum effective dose change? I think for most of us, we have to start with a paradigm shift. We don't go from end of LP to Texas method or end of LP to heavy light medium. There is a lot of transition between those two. The question is, when LP as written stops working, what is the first change you're going to make to keep making progress? And once you do that, is it still called LP? I don't know. Probably. I, I, I don't know. Right? It's a gray area. So Scott made the point here that it doesn't really matter if we call it LP or not. The point is that we stop thinking about this in terms of templates for each phase of advancement. And we instead shift our thinking towards identifying a problem and then making a change to solve the problem. Well, I, I, I was thinking about this earlier this afternoon. Here's, I'll, I'll go even the other way. I kind of think programming and training is always linear. It's always linear. Right? It's just the curve changes a little bit. Like if somebody's doing block training, like what, again, you talk about like what charity's doing with block or a DUP, like the weights all start low and they end high. It all still like the stress itself is still linear. And even if you're doing bodybuilding type stuff, which, you know, we hate those guys, but even if that's what you're doing and you're just trying to add muscle mass and you're just trying to do time under tension and those sorts of things, 
like that stuff is still linear too. It has to be specific to the goal, right? So if the goal is to add more muscle, then the volume and the time under tension and the total stress and the tonnage and all those things has to sort of be linear across the board anyway. So while it may have a little bit of up and down in a specific weekly period or even a specifically monthly period, overall, the stress is going to continue to go up, right? You can still sort of extract a line that's, the thing about LP is it's literally purely linear. It's add five pounds every single workout to every single lift. There is no wave whatsoever. Another question, does generally strong as a goal mean hitting a certain weight for a PR based on your age, gender, et cetera? Well, I mean, you're going to hit PRs. PRs are the goal. What the PR is doesn't matter that much. Again, for those of you guys that have done, especially if you've done multiple meets, if you've done more than two meets, strength lifting, power lifting, whatever, you, re- you realize, especially in those two lifts, like, Strongman and some other sports are a little more competitive, like actually for winning. But in powerlifting and strongman, nobody cares. Nobody cares who wins. The first time you train a client who's never done a meet and you're trying to get them to go to a meet, they'll be like, Do you think I'll do okay? Do you think I'll place? Like, do you think it plays? Like, who cares? You're going to hit PRs. PRs are the goal. PRs are the goal. We go to meets because it cranks up the intensity of the actual training, it puts some pressure on you to set PRs. And PRs are the goal. And if you do enough meets, you eventually hit enough PRs, eventually you win the meets, right? But if like Eric Lillibridge comes in, he's going to kill you, you're going to lose. But you're not competing against Eric Lillibridge, you're competing against you. That's why we celebrate PRs, no matter how big or how small. So when that lady presses the barbell, especially like that 33-pound bar, for the very first time, we go ape shit crazy about it because it's a big PR. It's, a, it's as big of a PR as somebody pressing 315. That It's a PR that matters. Get your clients addicted to setting PRs, not just one rep maxes, three by fives, five by fives, three by threes, three rep maxes, whatever, like all those PRs matter. That's where it's at. If they continue to set PRs, no matter how advanced they are, then then we win. Hey, guys, thank you very much. There'll be more open discussion starting next week for sure about what are potential changes we can make, what are the positive and negative effects of those changes, and we'll go from there. Thank you, guys. I'll catch you guys next week. All right, well, I hope you enjoyed part one of the MED Masterclass, and I hope you learned some more about programming and how you can apply this to solve your own programming problems after LP, whatever we decide that, LP is and when it ends. As always, if you have any questions for Matt or Scott about this, you can send them to questions at barbell-logic.com and they will answer that on a future Q&A. Q&As are on Thursdays, so make sure you stay tuned for those. I also want to remind you that Barbell Logic has a big library of written content as well. If you go to the website and click on free content and look at the articles, there is an article called Minimum Effective Dose a practical approach for the early advanced trainee. So if you want to kind of reinforce what you've listened to here with the written word, then go read that article. Um, There's many other articles about programming and how to slice and dice various programs within the context of what we just talked about with with MED methodology. So go check those out at barbelllogic.com and we will see you on Thursday. 